Well, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining the Asia Society. The topic for the program this evening or your morning is an important and an extremely fluid topic. And one, if not handled properly, could have major impacts, not only for the Chinese economy, but for the global economy. And that is the fate of Evergrande, which is one of China's largest real estate companies, which is struggling on a daily basis to meet its payment obligations on its $300 billion worth of debt. Concerns are growing that other Chinese real estate companies are not far behind with mounting debts and inability to service them. Alarm bells are ringing for Chinese citizens whom have invested their nest eggs in property, potentially leading to social unrest. And day by day, developments are being closely watched by investors and analysts concerned that the fate of Evergrande will have significant impacts on the Chinese and global economies at a time when the global economy is still dealing with COVID and related economic fallout. Evergrande's problems also come at a time when Xi Jinping is reigning in the private sector, in, in the data sector, entertainment, education, with no breaks in sight as he prepares for the 20th Party Congress. What are we to make of all these developments and how concerned should we be? What does Evergrande tell us about Xi Jinping's view of the private sector, the over-leveraged real estate market, and his views on how to steer the Chinese economy in the common prosperity era? And what does this mean for the global economy, which is so dependent on Chinese growth and specifically for US and other foreign investors? We're fortunate to have two of the most qualified speakers to help us unpack all of this, Kevin Rudd and Henry Cornell. We'll open the program with remarks by Kevin Rudd, president of the Asia Society, president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and former prime minister of Australia. And he has been closely monitoring and analyzing these developments and will help us understand their significance and how they fit into the broader trends with respect to Chinese economic and political developments. Following that, we'll turn to Henry Cornell to share his views. Henry is a senior partner at Cornell Capital. And prior to that, he was vice chairman of the merchant banking division at Goldman Sachs. Importantly, he's a valued and long-term friend of the Asia Society serving as an important trustee. With his 35 years of experience in the private equity world, he's well positioned to help us sort out what the Evergrande saga means for US investors and the global economy. Just one procedural issue, we'll have time for questions and answers <clears throat> after their remarks. And I urge you to start thinking of what you wanna ask our speakers. Please share your questions using the chat function of YouTube and Facebook. And with that, let me turn to Kevin Rudd. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Wendy, for the kind introduction. And it's good also to be here with Henry Cornell, our much valued uh, trustee who works uh, in these markets. Um, and Wendy, thank you for the work that you're doing as our vice president based in Washington and responsible for our economic uh, trade uh, and technology agenda. Um, Evergrande uh, has become exceptionally topical um, for markets, but also for policymakers. And what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to locate, as it were, the Evergrande crisis within the wider remit of China's current politics, China's macroeconomic policy settings, and its perception of um, financial risk within it, as well as indicate where it seems to be that the Chinese uh, system is headed in terms of the long-term management of Evergrande and the problems it presents to Xi Jinping. First point is we need to understand where Evergrande happens in terms of China's current macro uh, challenges. If you're sitting in Xi Jinping's seat at the moment, there are three big ones. Number one, how do I get re-elected as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in 12 months from now? Uh, always looms large in the minds of politicians. Number two, uh, how do I deal with a slowing Chinese economy? 
And three, how do I deal with an increasingly adversarial geostrategic environment? During Xi Jinping's period in office, <clears throat> my overall <clears throat> uh, analysis is that he has taken Chinese politics to the left. He's taken Chinese political economy to the left, albeit more recently so. And he's moved Chinese nationalism as expressed through Chinese foreign policy and security policy and international economic policy to the right. And so therefore, it's useful to ha perhaps have that frame in mind as we look at the Evergrande phenomenon as well. Let me take just one of those observations, moving the Chinese political economy center of gravity to the left. We see that reflected um, as a combination of Xi Jinping's quite deep Marxist-Leninist ideological worldview. We see it also as reflected in his statist view of China's national challenge at present, particularly in terms of what's happening in the world around him. We also see Xi underneath it all wrestling with the great problems of Chinese demography, a shrinking workforce and potentially a shrinking population mm -hmm. already or soon. If you look within that uh, economic policy pillar again and try to conceptualize again, where does this Evergrande phenomenon uh, and associated uh, macro financial risk lie within his economic worldview, there are a few concepts we should familiarize ourselves with. One is what Xi Jinping now calls routinely the new development concept. Um, and this, in many respects, has come to replace as a standard stock phrase that period of reform and opening, gai gu kai fang, that we became very familiar with between 1978 and 2018. And um, what we see is this new term, this new development concept, and increasingly becoming the replacement idea. It's got some subsidiary concepts, which I'll elaborate on for a bit, the dual circulation economy, as well as the Commons Prosperity Doctrine, as well as security and development. What are all these code language for? The dual circulation economy is essentially code language for greater and greater levels of Chinese economic self-reliance and less exposure by China to international supply chains or the possibility of being at the receiving end of uh, decisions in Washington or elsewhere, which would materially affect China's economic well-being. The common prosperity agenda is code language for greater equity within the Chinese system and a greater redistribution of wealth. And the security and development um, uh, buzzword uh, is in fact a code language for a prioritization of the national security of the Chinese state, including its national financial security and freedom from externally manipulated financial risk. These terms have become very active in the Chinese public political discourse over the last several months, and in some cases, a couple of years. And of course, at a more micro level, we see parallel shifts to the left in terms of China's attitude to its state-owned enterprise sector, China's aggregate attitudes to the private sector, as well as China's approach to industrial policy, now turbocharged by frankly, industrial scale industry guidance funds, uh, whereby the Chinese state through SOEs and sometimes directly now engage in very large scale so-called strategic industry investments. The overall pattern that I'm seeking to paint for you is that in aggregate terms, this is a macroeconomic policy shift. I'm not here talking about monetary and fiscal policy so much, but a macro policy shift towards the left in the sense that it's a move back to the party state and somewhat away from the market, if that is the pole of analysis that we can agree on. However, um, life, as you know, in politics and political economy is not a perfect beast. So simultaneously, Xi Jinping is having to wrestle with what he describes as um, macro financial risk. And one of the listed national financial risks uh, that we have um, had from the Chinese system for some time now is how to avoid any problems with an individual financial institution or financial conglomerate from becoming a systemic risk across the entire Chinese system. And when you now have a Chinese debt level of some 285% of GDP, 
Uh, this is not small by global standards. In fact, it's out there very large by global standards, not just in aggregate, but in relative terms. If those two things, therefore, my analysis of the movement to the left in terms of China's macro policy settings and its micro policy settings are accurate, um, and the presentation of China's uh, continuing concern for avoiding systemic financial risk, how do the Chinese themselves conceive of it right now? It's interesting when you look at the Chinese leadership's definition of its own top five economic problems, it is one, changing the economic growth model to innovation consumption-led growth. Uh, that's, frankly, uh, the uh, new development concept that I referred to before. Unbalanced development, that is both in terms of regional and national income levels. That's the common prosperity mm -hmm. agenda I referred to before. Lower productivity growth and demographic deficit. Fourthly, the property bubble. And fifthly, systemic financial risk. So in their own language, um, the top or two of the top five of the aggregate economic challenges faced by the leadership, in fact, cross over with the Evergrande problem that we are currently addressing in our discussion today. And then uh, within the debt question itself and avoiding um, uh, property-related uh, crises across the financial system, uh, the Chinese state as of August last year, began to issue its own guidelines about what were tolerable levels of debt which we tolerated within the sector. And I'll come back to those in a minute. Uh, these are often expressed in terms of Xi Jinping's or the Chinese system's three red lines. Uh, and I'll come back to those in a minute. The reason for that lengthy introduction to the um, subject that we're dealing with today is that that's the prism through which Xi Jinping views the Evergrande reality and those around him. It intersects obviously with his political world because you don't want to have uh, a domestic financial crisis in the 12 months leading up to your aspiration to be re-elected uh, for a record third term as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party in November next year. It intersects with his left-leaning economic world because Evergrande of itself is symptomatic of the excesses of the billionaire class. Um, it also directly impacts on his concept of uh, equity as it, as it relates to home and housing affordability for working families. It affects his uh, concept, therefore, of demography and making it more possible to keep, for families to have enough disposable income to have more kids and to afford a house. And it affects other elements uh, of his overall economic reset as he seeks to redirect what he would describe as unproductive investment into more productive forms of investment. But also it intersects directly, that's Evergrande, the real world of uh, the abiding concern of the Chinese Communist Party to avoid systemic financial risk. Remember, put this in mind, 41% of China's $45 trillion in banking assets um, are exposed in one way or, or another to the property sector. And 27% of China's $30 trillion in loans are tied up also in the property market. So in other words, these issues directly bring Evergrande into sharp focus as Xi Jinping looks at uh, how to deal with the problem that is now looming large in his intray. There's one final point I'd make by way of introduction. It's important for us also to bear this one in mind. Xi Jinping has, um, in a parallel debate for some years now, emphasised what he calls the paramount importance of the real economy. The Chinese term here is shi ti jingji, as opposed to what he describes as the fictitious economy. The real economy, in his definition, is all about advanced manufacturing. It's all about infrastructure. It's all about technology. Uh, and it's all about deep economic transformation. What he describes as building a modern economic system. By contrast, the fictitious economy is about asset bubbles, property bubbles, and financial bubbles, which are built on that. And this has become a parallel ideological debate within the Chinese system and almost reached its um, clarification point several years ago when he simply said, houses are for people to live in not to speculate on.
So I simply draw that to people's attention as well. It's part of the Marxist-Leninist ideological framework which Xi Jinping brings to bear in looking at this equation. In terms of Evergrande's current circumstances, I think those um, uh, uh, watching our webcast will be familiar with how this has evolved over the last couple of years. Evergrande's been around since 1996. It established, has been established by a Chinese billionaire by the name of Xu Jiaying. Um, and as of 2020, had accumulated some $300 billion in total liabilities. Um, and um, the equivalent of around $89 billion in interest-bearing borrowings as of that time, 42% of which are due um, in less than a year from now. It has some 1,300 projects currently underway right across the country. It has some 200,000 staff and about 3.8 million people every year who work for Evergrande in terms of project-specific work. Um, this, uh, therefore, puts into some perspective the overall scale of what we are dealing with uh, in the Evergrande uh, challenge. Um, in terms of the government's response to Evergrande so far, uh, it's worthwhile cataloguing what has happened over the last um, uh, several months and going back to, in fact, June of last year. June 21, China's top financial regulator, the Financial Stability and Development Committee, met with an urged Evergrande founder, Xu Jiaying, to solve his company's debt problems as quickly as possible. August 12, central government instructed authorities in Guangdong province to map out a plan to manage Evergrande's debt problems. August 19, the People's Bank of China and the Bank, China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission summoned Evergrande's senior executives to a meeting um, and instructed them to solve the Evergrande debt issue. August 21, uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban uh, and, Regional and Rural Development instructed local subsidiaries across the country to supervise funds for Evergrande's property projects uh, in special escrow accounts, signalling that homeowners would come first in Beijing's priority uh, for dealing with the Evergrande crisis. In early September this year, the Financial Stability Development Committee ordered provincial governments to establish working groups to monitor social and economic instability around Evergrande. That is, as public protest activity began to become manifest. September 22, at least two local governments in China, districts in Guangzhou and in Zhuhai, took control of sales revenue from Evergrande's properties to block potential misuse of funds. September 23, Chinese authorities ordered local governments to get ready for a possible storm, quote unquote. Um, People's Bank of China on September 27 released a statement vowing to ensure, quote, a healthy property market, unquote, and to protect home buyers' lawful rights. September 28, sources familiar with the matter informed Reuters and uh, that Beijing was prodding government owned firms to begin looking at. Uh, them taking control of and purchasing various Evergrande assets. And then by September 29, the People's Bank of China had injected some 750 billion yuan, um, 116 billion US into the financial system by consecutive open market operations in order to ensure that markets remain liquid. So that's a quick summary of the recent chronology of the Chinese state's response and earlier, um, the significance of Evergrande within the system. So let me conclude these remarks before we turn to, um, to Henry uh, for his observations from a market perspective of what therefore is the prognosis? I think it's important to understand that all this occurs against a background of the Chinese having had a uneven pattern of dealing with deleveraging in the period since the 2015 uh, financial market crisis in China. We've had an on-again, off-again approach. Progress made during 16 and 17, but frankly, as the trade war bit between China and the United States, the pressure on the deleveraging campaign within China began to, to taper off. And then with the coronavirus uh, in 2020, it tapered off even further. But this deleveraging efforts in order to de-risk the Chinese financial system remain still their overriding paradigm for analysis. Where might else we look in terms of how they would handle this Evergrande challenge? Well, China now has recent field experience in dealing with 
potential collapse of institutions. They go by the name of Anbang, Baoshang Bank, uh, HNA, and Huarong. With Anbang, it's important to bear in mind how big that investment and insurance conglomerate was. It had more than $329 billion in total liabilities and was brought under state control back in 2018. Baoshang, um, the regional development, the regional lending bank, which was also state owned, $32 billion in debts. It was allowed, however, to go bankrupt. Um, and I think the reason <clears throat> that it did so was that it's not deemed to have been systemically significant, though market analysts observed it and they were determined to send a message to the rest of the financial system. With h &A, one of China's largest global asset buyers, some $77 billion in debts, uh, under the control of state bankruptcy regulators now and forced to split into four separate entities. And then the fourth one is Huarong, the asset manager, $150 billion in debt, partially bailed out by a government through state-owned investment groups and its chairman, Lai Xiaomin, in fact, executed for corruption in January of 2021. Therefore, drawing upon that most recent um, institutional experience, uh, what are we likely to see unfold in relation to China's handling of Evergrande? I think if you look at uh, the expert commentary from a number of the international investment banks um, and a number of international institutions, including the IMF, the IMF, for example, has stated as of September 21 that the organization believes, quote, China has the tools and the policy space to prevent this turning into a systemic crisis, unquote. <clears throat> Barclays macro strategists have stated, quote, the conditions are simply not in place for even a large default for this to be a China Lehman moment, unquote. As the Chinese policy community therefore gather to look at the current crisis represented by uh, Evergrande, there'll be arguments in favour of propping Evergrande up, that is, uh, why disrupt the entire sector now, despite the fact that this player has got themselves into serious difficulty. And rem remember what I said before, the property sector represents some 29% of GDP. Um, but uh, that ultimately doesn't hold sway given the overall predisposition towards deleveraging and, frankly, an emerging Chinese concern for moral hazard. Arguments in favour of uh, bankrupting uh, the Evergrande uh, conglomerate, largely surrounding moral hazard, sending a clear signal to the rest of the industry uh, that it's time to bring your house in order. But the arguments in favour of uh, orderly distribution of assets would seem to be based on both precedent referring to what happened in the case of uh, Anbang, in the what is happening in the case of uh, Huarong, and what is happening in the case of HNA. It is also seems to be reflected in the evidence of the behaviour of certain officials, albeit at the local and provincial levels now, as they deal with instructions from Beijing to prepare uh, for uh, the purchase of certain uh, distressed assets uh, from the Evergrande Group. Therefore, and I hasten to say this is not market advice, we at the Asia Society Policy Institute don't provide market advice. Um, but if you look at the evidentiary trails of where all this is headed, based on China's recent experience of these other four big cases, plus the early evidence of what officials are doing on the ground, it would seem uh, that um, the uh, most likely outcome on balance is an orderly distribution of assets to a mix of private and state buyers. Um, but within that, we need to be very mindful of the disciplines to be applied. The priority, it would seem, is to be delivered to those who currently have apartments owed to them, which have been already paid for, and which the Chinese state believes that Chinese families are still uh, have an entitlement to. In other words, if you're one of those hundreds of thousands of Chinese who are currently paid for an Evergrande piece of real estate, that is, a, um, a piece of property, namely an apartment. The predisposition of the Chinese state, based on the evidence that we see, will be to treat those folks, number one, in terms of the handling of any orderly uh, distribution uh, of Evergrande's assets. On the second question, um, it is we are then looking at the world of who are the domestic creditors, who are the domestic shareholders and who are the domestic bondholders? And again, the emerging pattern of evidence is that they will be preference second, possibly receiving a haircut. And I'll leave to one side the particular handling of shareholders in this. 
bondholders, uh, domestic bondholders, a haircut, how big a haircut uh, remains to be seen. But coming third and last in this list is likely to be foreign shareholders and foreign bondholders. And therefore, uh, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out what that would mean in terms of international market perception. There is therefore likely to be, in the context of this orderly uh, handling of the uh, Evergrande case, a differential treatment of the various stakeholders who are affected uh, by any, as it were, movement to wind down uh, uh, Evergrande's operations. To conclude, um, uh, we can go into the q and go in terms of China's macroeconomy and where it goes in terms of its impact on the international economy as well. Uh, but it's important also simply to note in passing that going back to the politics of 2020, the Chinese system um, is already unleashed the Central Discipline Inspection Commission to go right through China's financial institutional frameworks again to identify misfeasance and malfeasance across the sector. That in turn, in my judgment, will have a further impact on confidence within the financial services industry in China itself and the property sector in particular. Back to you, Wendy. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. You've put a lot of um, um, information and analysis on the table. I would encourage our viewers to start thinking of questions as I now turn to Henry Cornell to offer his perspective, perspective on Evergrande. What does this mean for China? What does this mean for global investors? And in particular, um, I would just ask you the question, what Kevin said at the end, if indeed foreign investors are at the bottom of the totem pole and um, are not treated um, as equally with um, domestic stakeholders, what does this mean? What are the implications of that? Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Kevin. It's uh, an honor to be here. I must say that following Kevin reminds me of that old a uh, joke, the whole world is a tuxedo and you're just a pair of brown shoes. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I will tell you that most crises create opportunities. This is a little unique and your question, Wendy, about what this means if foreigners are at the bottom of the totem pole or Kevin's point uh, creates an issue. But as I was thinking about the situation we're in right now, for some reason, I kept going back to George Orwell and the fact that his prescience um, in calling out political developments way beyond his time is really appropriate now because it feels to me, just from a pure investment point of view, you have to take the world into consideration, obviously, but the world is devolving from that hope for cooperation and unification that globalization might bring into Orwellian satrapies of power politics with the US and China squaring off, uh, Europe playing a little bit of a weak swing boat, and India not yet quite on the world stage, but getting there as witnessed by the new Quad arrangements. But I start with this overall observation because the importance of Evergrande in this context is the concern that it could be akin to Sarajevo, you know, a small event, even a material financial one, ignites larger issues with uncontrollable outcomes. And it's interesting to me to note how similar politically China and the U.S. are right now in their approach to a domestic audience. The nomenclature is clearly different, but the policy effects are driving in the same direction. And I think that creates real risk globally. You know, as Kevin mentioned, she sees the rise of the entrepreneurial class in China and maybe even the urban middle class as a potential threat to party control. And Ding Xiaoping's bargain, at least when I lived in China, of wealth creation, um, but no vote, so to speak, has raised living standards, as everyone knows, faster and wider um, almost than any other country in the history of the world. And I was very fortunate to be in China from 91 to 2000 and watch the country go from Mao suits to blue suits and bicycles to cars um, in, in a singular creation. And it was just an honor to be present at the creation of modern China. But as these entrepreneurs became emboldened to speak out publicly and sometimes critically 
The state justified the need to sacrifice them or is in the process of sacrificing them under the guise of limiting foreign influence, as Kevin mentioned, self-reliance and inequality in the service of the greater good of the state. And as with the absorption of Hong Kong and in the spirit of what happened in 89, at least in some aspects, Deng Xiaoping would approve of this assertion of control. But the unleashing of Chinese creativity, discipline and power is now at risk and could be chilled indefinitely as a particular set of policies is being implemented. The state control and innovation do not necessarily inspire each other. And if China retrenches and its growth rate falters, this harms the global economy. And if this sacrifice of the age old, if you will, 80-20 rule in the name of control and redistribution occurs and is coupled with a bailout of the property sector, China's locomotive to global growth will certainly be stalled. In the States, on the other hand, the infrastructure bill, COVID relief, adding trillions of dollars to the national debt is a dramatic insertion of government intervention, which potentially materially distorts capital formation and distribution, potentially unleashing the inflation that we had in the 1970s. The cost of capital and investment will become prohibitively expensive and seriously curtails growth. This could also chill the most creative elements in the States, as it's hard to think great thoughts, much less fund them in a crisis. And so if there's confiscatory tax rates as well introduced, uh, the government will certainly crowd out creative capital. And while the Fed has few tools left in its toolbox to fix the problem and current government expenditures are 44% of the GDP here in the States and continuing to grow, not to be too provocative, we could almost stumble into that socialist paradise that some people dream of. To me, this is a terrifying scenario, both in China and the States, and as my comments are designed to be provocative for the Q&A, but if the world's two giants falter and catch cold, the world's malaise will make COVID look like a paper cut. And further to this point, when discordant populations make their angst very public, there always seems to be the advent of a foreign crisis or boogeyman created to direct attention away from domestic issues. The drama in the Taiwan Strait could transform from theater into a grimmer reality. And Barbara Tuckman in the Guns of August warned, is warning us great powers sometimes stumble into war. But back to real estate, I didn't mean to wax on this, but when we make investments, generally the investment class, if you will, certainly takes into account the risk and the opportunity in front of you. But with respect to the pure real estate drama unfolding, as Kevin said, there's a history in China, there's a history in states and a history in Europe. These are time-tested solutions to the current real estate implosion, which actually, if implemented properly, so completely reversing this bottom of the totem pole concept, could create closer global co cooperation and integration. So in my life, um, you know, if you cut back to the two most recent real estate scenarios, that created quote unquote opportunity, the SNL crisis of 91 here in the States, a little bit the financial IMF crisis in Asia in the late 90s, and then the crisis in 08. Solutions were created that actually stabilized the market and created foundations for growth. So the SNL crisis, you know, just to remind everyone, was building up in the 80s and exploded in 91, threatening the larger US economy due to real estate lending, speculation, um, different from Evergrande, but uh, certainly in that orbit. But what was interesting to me, the lesson was a democratically controlled Congress created the RTC, which as everyone knows, garnered all failed real estate loans and auctioned them off in tranches. The US backstopped the RTC with an unprecedented at the time $400 billion which when the dust finally settled, the bill was 125 billion. So a small price to pay to backstop the market. I do remember, because I was there, private capital started buying these assets at less than 10 cents on the dollar. But within four years, the last auctions were at par. And this led to 
a real foundation that the growth of the 90s and into the 2000s could have been built upon. The auctions and cram downs that resulted in the 08 crisis worked in a similar fashion, but I would argue that due to government priming and not having a true auction in many instances, the recovery was slower and didn't create the most secure bottom to provide growth. Now, China, as Kevin mentioned, has this playbook, you know, from when Wang Shishan ran the construction bank in the early 90s and was getting rid of assets then to Huarong. Um, but if China actually would open up the market and tranche these things with a backstop and treat global capital as being welcomed into the market as just providing a foundation and a backstop to some of these loans, it may actually allow more peace and cooperation to occur. And so I know there's a concern about foreigners owning assets. And I just recall back to the quote unquote Japanese invasion here in the States in the eighties when there was hysteria about Japanese investors owning assets around the country. But I think we can comfort people that you're not putting these apartments on a boat and sailing them back to London and New York and due to the influx of this capital, could it actually hasten and be in China's interest to create more convertibility of the renminbi in order to satisfy these claims in auctions, which would actually be more of a challenge to the United States, but further integrate China into the global economy. And so, you know, there's precedent for this previously. Whether this can happen in China at the moment is an open question. They could certainly do it themselves, as Kevin suggested, they, they can make their printing presses go, but they would certainly have to cut other programs that are near and dear to the heart of many in the Politburo, because I'm, you know, remember LBJ's guns and butter of the 60s led to the massive inflation of the 70s. And she and Biden would do better to heed this lesson, which would help both domestic economies and the global economy. So I'll leave, I'll leave it there, Wendy, and obviously can talk more about the mechanics of how those SNL auctions and the 08 auctions and the cram downs worked. But from an investment point of view, my concern is we could stumble into a scenario that would make investment the least of our opportunities. And we're dealing with a lot more problems. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot on the table here. Maybe I'll just start um, with some questions just targeted on, on Evergrande. And, and I think Kevin, you did a good job kind of explaining policy response. And I believe you, um, you and Henry both agree that you don't see Xi Jinping bailing out Evergrande. On the other hand, um, he's not gonna let this go into bankruptcy. At least we don't think so. Kevin, you mentioned this orderly distribution of assets as kind of the, the policy um, course that's being followed. And I guess my question for both of you that um, seems to have worked in previous instances in China, but can that work with Evergrande? What are, what are the chances it will succeed? And what are the tripwires? I mean, what could happen to make this kind of blow up and not work? What, would, what should we be looking for as these assets are sold off? Kevin, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you, uh, Wendy. Just two or three quick points on this. <clears throat> I think we need to be also clear about, let's call it the public policy tripwire, which if you like inadvertently triggered this crisis in the first place. And this was, uh, I referred before to uh, the Xi Jinping's three red lines uh, as far as uh, the property sector was concerned. Uh, and they are, from August last year, never formally published, but actually operationalized on the ground. <clears throat> One, a 70% ceiling on liabilities to assets. Two, 100% cap on net debt to equity. And three, quote, sufficient cash uh, to cover short-term borrowing. And it was the operationalization of that um, through uh, the uh, financial uh, regulatory apparatus in Beijing, which actually then progressively brought 
Evergrande under, as it were, systematic scrutiny. So the key question, uh, Wendy, is applying those same three rules, if they're to be sustained into the future, what other um, uh, operators within the massive Chinese property sector, of which Evergrande is big, uh, but by no means the only uh, major player with this intersection of property and finance, what other uh, players within the property sector therefore are brought into focus? Those who follow the debate closely will know, of course, in the last 24 hours or so, you've had developments uh, with uh, Fantasia Asia, uh, which is um, uh, <clears throat> a mid-sized real estate developer failing to make a $206 million bond repayment on October the 4th. So in terms of other elements of the sector being caught by this regulatory tripwire, um, it will be important for us to analyse Will the tripwire itself, the, the three red lines, be relaxed if there is too much evidence of, as it were, uh, others, significant players in the sector being captured by it? Because whereas $300 billion worth of liabilities with Evergrande may be digestible within a massive Chinese property and financial sector, if you have an aggregation of these, you get to the point of how much is then, as it were, digestible. So I think that is a critical question for us to observe carefully, analytically, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, and I'll be very interested to hear what Henry has to say. Well, I think to keep in mind that the 300 billion plus of Evergrande is not worth zero. And mm -hmm. so neither is Fantasia. I think I read in the paper there, 13 billion of liabilities, and then there's uh, Guangzhou RNF and Cynic. I mean, there's, you know, you're right, Kevin, you add these all up and it's, it's becoming overwhelming. But if the solution to the problem can be parsed such that existing operating entities, operating pieces of real estate can be sold at whatever clears the market, then it's literally just putting the hands of this, these assets in a new owner who would then manage them. And it, at least what I read in the paper about Evergrande is they're selling their property management company potentially to another company in Hong Kong. But then I looked up the market cap of that company in Hong Kong and they were 7 billion and their purchase offer was 5 billion. So they're gonna wind up financing this as well, creating more of a problem, which is why I think if China opened its doors a little bit, and allowed foreign capital as well as domestic capital to intermingle, it wouldn't put as big a strain on the entire Chinese system. No one's moving the assets, at least the existing operating assets. And I think they would find a home. You can package these, take all of the quote unquote operating assets in Shanghai, for example, and just sell them off in tranches. And you do this over a period of years in an orderly fashion. The point you raised, which I think is more of a political problem for Xi, is everyone who put money down for a new apartment that's nothing more than poured concrete at this time. That becomes a particular issue, but you can also solve that as that was solved, frankly, um, in 08 and solved in 91, where you just require whoever buys it for pennies to finish the project and they build that into their bid. So there are real common sense solutions, but it does require the Chinese government to cooperate, which may go against some of the things that she is trying to implement in a broader political sense. You mean cooperate with the international community? Correct, correct. Yeah, but doesn't he now, seem- could, could she go to the insurance companies of China and say, you must take capital out of your general account and support this for the good of China, could certainly do it, could go to the tech companies. I believe Alibaba is contributing $15 billion to the buildup of local enterprise. So there are, as I said earlier, there are, there is certainly an ability within China's economic sphere to solve this problem in a quote unquote patriotic way. I just see it, and maybe I'm being foolish and optimistic, as a way to create stability and peace more within the global system and bring China further in um, if they opened it up to some foreign capital. Kevin, do you think that's realistic? Uh, 
Um, it is um, possible, but not probable at this stage. Um, it's possible because there are people in the Chinese financial regulatory system who have been trained at the same institutions that uh, Henry has and who think the same way and have actually have a rational approach uh, to the way in which you manage any challenge within markets, which is when you've got a corporation or institution in trouble, then how do you best, uh, as it were, distribute the assets in an orderly fashion because those assets are worth something. And that furthermore, it's therefore best to have a competitive process through which those assets are then distributed. And if you simply just uh, depended on, um, as it were, administrative state allocation of the assets in Beijing, um, then the bottom line is those assets are less likely to be rationally distributed with some cognizance of their real value and price in markets. If you throw it open to uh, an assets uh, auction, in effect, then it's more likely to achieve a realistic market price. So that's how those sort of folks uh, within the Chinese system will be thinking. Um, and we can call them uh, disciples of Cornell. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, but no, they will have exactly the same, frankly, rational markets analysis paradigm. Then you run in headlong into the political economy uh, framework that I described before which in the Chinese system is becoming much more statist, becoming much more party-centric and much more, shall we say, nationalist in terms of its predisposition not to uh, provide levels of uh, leverage uh, and or, by which I mean political leverage, not debt leverage, leverage and control to international institutions. So at this stage, my own judgment is those nativist arguments in China are likely to prevail. But the other arguments, which Henry's just put on the table, will be being circulated um, and they will be part of the ongoing internal discussion, unlikely at this stage to prevail. But the caveat here, and this is where I agree with Henry, is if Fantasia is just one of now a number of series of firms in the property sector, which um, are captured by Xi Jinping's three red lines for the sector, then you start to get an order of magnitude where you need a bigger pool of capital uh, to deal uh, with um, this um, orderly asset uh, distribution process beyond those who can be put together with Team China, China Inc., or as someone said recently, CCP Inc., Chinese Communist Party Inc., in bringing together uh, the um, critical um, mass necessary to absorb uh, these um, distressed assets without creating systemic uh, instability. We can pivot a little. Kevin, you had mentioned that one of the things Xi Jinping is facing is slowing economic growth. Um, and I think next week or the week after, we should be hearing third quarter GDP growth from China. There have been a lot of um, occurrences over the, uh, during that quarter, which suggests that number may not be as high as some people are expecting. And that has led some analysts to even lower their earlier forecasts of 8.4% 8, 8 annual growth in 2021 to 8% or even I saw one analyst lowering it to 7.9%. What does this mean for Xi Jinping going into the 20th Party Congress, particularly if some of the policies that he's been following this year, including clamping down on the private sector, um, is is perceived as contributing to the slower ec slowing economic growth. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Um, this Evergrande debate that we're having today, uh, as I indicated in my early remarks, uh, is located within a much wider context of a uh, macro policy shift towards the left on Xi Jinping's part. Um, and by left, I mean in the ultimate. Um, balance between the power of the party and the state at one end of the spectrum and the power and autonomy of markets in, at the other end of the spectrum. And what I sense and have deduced across multiple policy instruments is the gradual movement of that centre of gravity uh, towards the party state and away from the market uh, in uh, the last several years um, and gathering pace since the 19th Party Congress of 2017. Uh, secondly, it's my view that um, the natural consequence of that shift in the centre of gravity, um, take one major example between state-owned enterprises and private enterprises and the role of industrial policy within China, 
uh, is that it does have a material impact uh, on confidence levels of the Chinese business sector. It does have a material impact on whether I've got sufficient confidence to continue to invest and to reinvest through private fixed capital investment in the Chinese economy. Um, unless you're going to revert to a socialist model where that is taken up purely by uh, industry guidance uh, funds or the new set of institutions created in the state and enterprise sector, uh, which become themselves investment vehicles to expand SOE operations. But given the relative size of the private sector, um, which is 60% of GDP, uh, given its, um, its uh, significance in generating employment, its significance in generating innovation, its significance in generating, frankly, the dynamism that uh, Henry has so eloquently pointed to before of the Chinese economy for the last 40 years. If it begins to be in retreat, um, and the first measurement of that would be private fixed capital investment numbers, then it does flow through to growth. Third point, and I'll conclude on this. If on top of that, you then have the administration of, let's call it a series of haircuts to the property sector, no bankruptcies, but such, shall we say, an orderly distribution of assets, it does send a macro message uh, from the regulators uh, to that sector, which represents 29% of GDP, um, that the same, shall we say, rollicking uh, experience of the last 40 years is going to start coming grinding towards, not crashing towards, but grinding towards a close. And given the relative significance of the sector in China's overall GDP numbers, I'm concerned that this, as it were, legitimate, rational policy direction to deleverage the property sector and the associated, uh, associated finance sector begins to, as it were, compound with um, and turbocharge the pre-existing slowing of the Chinese economy brought about by these macro policy shifts to the left that I referred to before. Bottom line, I suspect that the real Chinese growth numbers are slowing significantly. I'm not prepared to put a number on it. Um, and uh, the dilemma for policymakers will be this. Oh, my God, here we go again. Uh, if the private sector is slowing that badly, brackets, let's not discuss why, um, then are we left with a further requirement to then use public policy to pump prime to sustain growth rates in and around the magical number of six, uh, that is, on a sustainable basis going forward, leaving aside the abnormalities of the 2020 2021 recovery cycle brought about by COVID. Back to you. And Henry, as, as you look at um, steps Xi Jinping's taking in the tech sector, education, transportation, um, and now um, you know the real estate market, how concerned are you? And do you think we're going to see implications soon um, that will be captured in these GDP growth numbers? Yes, I think they're going down. And when you have electrical outages because there's not enough coal to keep the plants going, as you saw last week uh, in Guangzhou, in Guangdong, which is a huge part of the global way China faces the world, that's a problem too. I don't mean to pile on here, but if you don't have reliable electricity to power your factories, you will hasten at least foreign investment uh, to reconsider going to Vietnam or going to other locations. You've started to have those conversations, but you know, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. China's installed industrial base and worker facility is fantastic. And so I don't see a wholesale rushing south, but it will add to uncertainty. And I think it creates more issues um, around the larger Chinese economy, not just real estate. Um, but you know how everything gets done. Um, we're, we're reaching the conclusion of the program, but I wanted to um, bring up um, before we close the meeting today between Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, and Yang Shishir in Zurich. The White House has issued um, a press release um, underscoring the importance of maintaining open lines of communication talking about responsible competition. Um, it notes that Jake raised a number of concerns with respect to human rights, um, Taiwan, other issues. 
Um, but there does seem to be kind of a change in tone, more communication that has been underway since the Biden she called, uh, I think just about a few weeks ago. Um, Kevin, how, how do you interpret, um, wh where are we going? Are, is the temperature um, being lowered? Are there stronger efforts being made to kind of manage um, the relationship and the tensions? Yeah, Wendy, I think it's a really important question um, given it's just happened and it also therefore um, uh, affects, let's call it the, the geopolitical framework within which the discussions we're now having about the future of the Chinese economy and its future internationalization occurs. And geopolitics is never far from that table. Um, first point is if you do some quick parsing of the two sets of statements, one from the White House and one from uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry, which I've been reading carefully in the last five minutes, <laughs> is that um, it does seem to indicate um, an intentionality on both parties, uh, Young Jiechi and Jake Sullivan, and I know both these individuals really well, to bring the temperature down a notch. Um, and um, if I look, uh, for example, at um, Jake Sullivan's statement, uh, it refers to, or the White House, as it were, a briefing on the Jake meeting, it refers to um, it's important for there to be now uh, the management of re responsible competition. I think that's the word that's used. Um, echoes of, uh, of an earlier age uh, from an old colleague of yours, uh, Bob Zellick, uh, and responsible stakeholders, but now we have responsible competition. But what is it if we leave the individual phrases to one side? It basically is pointing in the direction of something which I've been writing about for a long time. How do we put responsible strategic guardrails around this relationship? Secondly, though, on the Chinese side, um, uh, you have new language and more positive language in one area of the Chinese statement. Uh, which says that uh, China attaches importance to Biden's recent positive statements on U.S.-China relations. He noted that the U.S. had stated that it has no intention of containing China's development and will not engage in a new Cold War. That's new language from the Chinese in the current environment. And so, therefore, that is a signal to the rest of the Chinese system that things with the United States may be slowly starting to stabilise um, in terms of the dynamics uh, of the overall political relationship. However, and there's always a however in a Chinese statement, um, and for those who are Chinese linguists, it's usually the kushi clause, the but clause, which comes to the paragraph three. It says, China opposes using competition to define US-China relations, unquote, bald statement. Um, and that is not just a question of elegant foreign policy taxonomy. It goes down to the overall approach to how the relationship is to be managed in the future and whether, therefore, strategic competition guardrails are permissible within the Chinese approach to the overall relationship. Final point is this. I think this is quite important. Chinese statement. Both parties agree to maintain regular dialogue and communication on important issues. And Xi and Biden would meet virtually before the end of this year as she confirmed that he would not be attending the G20 or COP26 in person. So in other words, put all that together, the White House statement, the Chinese Foreign Ministry statement, temperature level comes down a notch. Um, regular lines of communication now seem to be being in the process of re-established, given the fact that we didn't have that for, frankly, the last year or so of the Trump administration. It's been fairly patchy in the early Biden administration. And thirdly, um, there will be a, um, <clears throat> a virtual meeting between the two presidents. So on a score of um, 10, if, um, if uh, 10 is, um, is uh, going to war and, uh, and one uh, is when um, Henry and I were both working in China a long time ago and everything was peachy creamy, um, I think this gets us back to, uh, frankly, somewhere around about a six in the overall state of the relationship. Um, and, but don't expect the sorties against Taiwan uh, by the Chinese Air Force to stop anytime soon. That's prosecuting a separate and related Chinese agenda against the Taiwanese. Henry, last word. It's just an honor to be here with Kevin and listen <laughs> to him. I learn every time we get together. So I'm just happy to be here. So quick question for you. In six months from now, are we going to be talking about Evergrande? 
Yes. Kevin, yes or no? We'll be talking about Evergrande Plus. We'll be talking about, in my judgment, the relative, um, I'm going to use, I'm really going to chance my arm here, the relative success of the um, unbun style management uh, of the um, asset distribution of the Evergrande uh, conglomerate. Um, but we will also be talking about uh, the list of property and financial institutions which have also fallen foul of Xi Jinping's three red lines for this sector. And that means we still have an aggregate systemic financial challenge, not a crisis, a challenge uh, into the future. So perhaps the Asia Society will have an Evergrande Plus event. <laughs> <laughs> as long as Henry's there, because uh, I'm just a public policy wonk. Uh, Henry actually knows what he's doing. I mean, Henry's out there uh, working with real dollars in the real marketplace. So the more we do this together with um, policy wonks like you and I, Wendy, and people who actually have to commit capital, I think the more effective we're likely to be. You in, Henry? I'm in. I'm in. Look, I'm, I'm still long-term bullish. You know, we're going to open a Shanghai office shortly. So I believe long-term uh, into, into the China relationship in addition to what we already have in Hong Kong. So I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Okay. Well, on that note, I always love closing an event on an optimistic note. And recently, it's been harder and harder to do that. So thank you, Henry. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks to our viewers. Um, we look forward to staying engaged with our viewers and we have a lot of events coming up in the Asia Society, so please check our website. Good evening, good morning. Thanks everyone, bye.